Well, um, if you are, uh, if you started with us on Easter, uh, you will recognize a few of the things up here. Uh, we are doing a, a series called The Larger Story. And the first week we looked at, um, the title was Shattered Dreams. And we looked at um, uh, the, the metaphor of a beautiful glass tabletop that was our, our sort of pride and joy, the thing that we were living for in our smaller story, uh, just, just as a metaphor. And something happened that shattered uh, that glass tabletop, and it looked like, as the, the teenagers sometimes say, our life is over. And uh, sometimes it feels like that in this world. And yet God is able to sweep up all the pieces, the shards of the glass that's strewn all over the floor, put it up and put it into a cauldron and melt all that glass and pour it into a, a form. And then only God can make something like this, something that is very different from what we imagine, but um, can bring us great joy. The point uh, of God in our lives is he is trying to bring us to a place where we experience joy, ultimate joy, forever. Now, if you missed us, uh, or if you would like a copy of this poem, Dave Vega did some, some extra work for us uh, this week to produce these, and there are some copies of the poem that I wrote for um, Easter regarding... Um, the, uh, the glass swan. Last week, we looked at uh, the, 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 um, the dragonfly, the message of the dragonfly. And the message of the dragonfly um, is, again, it's, it's sort of a parallel with shattered dreams that when our life shatters and, and it looks like what, we're, what was most important to us uh, dies, so to speak, uh, out of that water beetle shell, a dragonfly is born. And the, the thing we talked about last week was that Jesus was trying to shine the light on the glory of God. And the more that we can see the wonder of who he is, the wonder of his character, how he's working in our lives, um, the easier it is to walk by faith, even through troubled waters. And the point of that is it gives us hope. There is hope. We always have something to look forward to, God's work in our lives. And today we look at the, uh, the, the, mess, the parable or the message of the seed, the lesson of the seed. Now, I have some things from home um, that um, we have in our backyard usually. And, uh, you know, I have our garden gloves. Uh, we have some uh, snips that we use. Um, an empty bag of potting soil. But you have to have potting soil if you're going to do this. And... Um, some gypsum to break up the, uh, our California clay, and a watering can. And at the end of this, you end up with something like this. Uh, now, the most important prop in here is one that you really can't see, and that is a small seed. You can have all the potting soil, all the gypsum, all the water that you want, but without this little seed, what you're going to have, and I can testify to, is weeds. <laughs> weeds. That's the parable of the seed. And, the, and what we're going to look at today is the principle of life out of death. The principle of life out of death. Well, in your handout, and we are looking at John chapter 12. The title of today's message is Finding Your Place in the Larger Story. <clears throat> And the metaphor here is uh, we all live for our smaller stories, and we think that uh, our smaller story is the most important story, and we are kind of the star of our story, and we sort of expect that God's going to cooperate with our smaller story. And God says, no, 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 I have a, a much larger story that I want to superimpose on top of your smaller story. And the larger story infuses life into our smaller story, purpose and meaning, and it particularly helps us when we go through very confusing and very dark times in our life. Uh, when I was much younger, uh, one of the movies that I enjoyed was uh, The Bridge uh, Over the River Kwai. Uh, it, was, it was filmed in 1957. It was a World War II movie about uh, some uh, Allied soldiers uh, who were caught by the Japanese army, and they were put in a prisoner of war camp. And the, uh, in Burma, and the British senior leader was trying to figure out a way to help his, uh, all of the, the prisoners that were there. Uh, and it was a time of despair for most of these men, uh, privation and, and suffering. And so he went to the, the commandant of the camp, and, it, and the commandant agreed 
that the soldiers could build a river over the river Kwai. And uh, so they got to work, and the, and the senior British uh, leader was, was so excited about this because he knew this would infuse a sense of purpose in the men, uh, and it was something they were committed to. It was something they could, they could see the progress and building of and provided meaning for their life in, in the midst of just uh, where everything was taken away from them. And the climax of the movie, and there are really two of these, the one that you, you sort of remember is when the, the bridge is blown up. Um, and it turns out that in real life, that bridge was of such a, um, an engineering feat uh, that railroads could go across it, that the Allies sent an expeditionary force to blow up the bridge. The second uh, climax of the film comes just about the same time, where the British senior officer realizes that what he had done in, in good intentions to help his men was they'd actually helped the, the enemy, the Japanese army, move material, armor, and soldiers uh, through Burma. Uh, and it was one of those things where you just go, what have I done? What have I done? Now, that movie is a metaphor for today's message. It's easy for us to think that our smaller story is the most important story because of what it does for us in the, in the immediate. I feel better. Things seem to be happening. I like my life. I'm feeling good about me. But in the long run, what we can't see is that we are on a path that leads to misery. Now, how do, how do we join the larger story? Well, there are five different people or groups we're going to look at today. Uh, one is locked on the larger story. That's Mary. And you see the glory of God in her life and pouring out beauty, the beauty of God to people and the beauty out of her own soul, her redeemed soul to others. Locked on the larger story. The second one is Judas, and he is lost in his smaller story. Lost in his smaller story. Then there are three groups of people. The third group of people are people who are fans of the larger story. Uh, they're sort of bellwether, when everything's going great, we, we like the larger story, kind of yay Jesus folks. The fourth group are seekers of the larger story. They're curious. They want to know more about this. And the fifth group are fighters of the larger story. We do not like the larger story, and that is not for us. No, thank you. In, f in fact, they're actually more against the larger story. So let's look at our five groups. First of all, John chapter 12, which we read just a few minutes ago, starts in verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Mary served while Lazarus was among those reclining at table with him. Now this, you know, when you, when you hear reclining at table, I think about, we have a couple of recliners uh, at our house, and, uh, but that's not the kind of reclining that they're talking about. When they ate, they sat at a table about a foot off the ground, and in order to eat, they would sit down at their place at the table and then sort of swivel sideways and lean on an elbow and their feet would, would go out behind the person next to them. And that's how they, they ate, reclining at table. That's, that's the picture here that is painted at the beginning of John chapter 12. Verse 3. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, this must have been just a, a, an amazing thing to be a part of and watch. She took something that was very expensive, and maybe it was a jar or something like this, a perfume, and when she opened the top, the aroma began to fill the room with, with, with something fragrant and fresh and alive. But then she walked over behind Jesus, and she began to pour this on his feet. Now, normally when you anointed someone with oil, you did it on their head. And the picture here is one of humility and worship, and gratitude. And she bends down at that point after she has done it, and she takes her long hair, and she begins to wipe his feet with this. And again, it's a picture of humility in its best sense, not in a, not in a negative sense, but in, in, in something that 
where she is giving something of who she is. She's presenting something of who she is, her soul, her heart, to Jesus in a very public setting. Uh, I, I, you think, well, why did she do that? I mean, what, what, would, what motivates her uh, to do this? And there are several things that come to my mind. Uh, we talk about the dance of the Trinity and uh, here, the, the wonder of how God the Father relates to God the Son, relates to God the Holy Spirit, relates to the Father, and there's this unselfish, lavish love that is poured out one upon the other in a way that they, they almost want to out-bless each other. Uh, that's what theologians call the dance of the Trinity. And you and I are invited into that, to share in that, to experience something of that here, fully in heaven, but sometimes some here, but then more so to lavish that on others. She is a recipient of this, and if, and if for no other reason than just that one, I think that would prompt somebody like Mary to do what we see here. She's worshiping. Her heart is filled with gratitude. She wants to give something back to Jesus. Now, th there's a second thing that I think about here. My mother used to tell me that only another mother knows the sacrifices that you have sacrificed for your children. And I, I've heard plenty of mothers say that uh, to me over the years. And, and there's something of that here in this story, I think, too, where Mary, more than anybody else, knows the mission Jesus is on and knows something of the sacrifice that it's going to require and there's something here that connects with him that says, just like a mom to another mom, the sacrifice is worth it. Something of that is going on here. I think in another way, she's, she wants to honor him, even if nobody else is in the room, but especially honor him publicly, or we might use the word saluting. She is saluting what he is about to do. And the fourth thing that strikes me is, I, is that is that she is trying to fortify him for what he's about to face, the horrors uh, and terrors of what he's going to do, something of that. Now, before I move on to, from Mary, I, I wanted to say something here that I, I'm just sort of mesmerized by. And that is, when, when a woman who knows Jesus like this is vulnerable and expresses something of who she is in her heart to somebody else, there is beauty that pours out of her soul that we get to experience. This seems to be pretty rare in our world. But you have a great picture of it here. There's something, every woman wants to know that there's beauty in her heart and that other people see that. And they're drawn to it. This is a picture here of Mary. Somebody locked on the larger story and expressing that uh, back towards Jesus. The second is the opposite of this. And this is Judas who is hopelessly lost in his smaller story. Verse 4. One of his disciples, Judas, who was later to betray him, objected. And this is going on while the dinner is going on in Mary's house. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth the year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, one of, the, one of the awful things about our human nature is illustrated right here, is while standing on his noble aspiration and his noble intention to, to care for the poor, he is at the same time living for himself as, as the real point of his story. And this is one of the things that is just, it's just so annoying. It's so annoying when somebody else does this and you sense it, and it's so annoying when that's you doing that. And, and, and to make this worse, I think he is critical of her, not just in his head, but right there in real time while she is there. Now, Jesus is there, you have the disciples are there, the dinner guests are there, Mary's brother, Lazarus and Martha, they're all there. And yet, if you asked Judas after this event, weren't you embarrassed to say that? Weren't you ashamed to say that? I think he would have said no. No, the poor. We care about the poor. The poor is more important. And what it illustrates 
is that when we are so committed to our smaller story that we will over time become blind to the effects of our relating on other people, just like this happened here. Most people who were married in that situation would have been humiliated by that statement. It probably rocked her initially, but um, I, don't, I don't think for long. Now, Jesus responds to this. Uh, uh, verse 7, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you. You will not always have me. So we have the first person, Mary, is locked in the larger story. Uh, and you see the glory of God alive in her and through her. And then you have Judas who was lost in his smaller story. And then three groups of people. The, the, the first group are the fan, fair weather fans of the larger story. And, the, and this is what we call Palm Sunday in, in our Christian world. Verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival, the Passover festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Now, there, is, uh, there are times when both non-Christians and Christians are, are fair-weather fans of Jesus. These folks had heard about the miracles of feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 and, and stilling a storm, uh, healing people who were uh, blind. And particularly, they'd heard about the resurrection of Lazarus. And, you know, everybody likes to follow a winner. We just like that. And as long as, as the win, winning team is going great, we're just so happy. We pay our tickets. We show up at the game. We buy the pennants and all the souvenirs. But, but, when, but when the team starts to disappoint, when it doesn't meet expectations, when God isn't doing what we think he ought to, then what happens to us? We become apathetic ambivalent. And this is sort of this, the fair weather fans. At the end of this week, some of these very people will be crying out, not Hosanna, but crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Now why? Fair weather fans. As long as God is doing what I want him to do, I'm in. But as long as God is not doing what I want him to do, then I'm disillusioned. I'm taking my football home. Verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. And this is from Zechariah 9.9. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey colt. And the, it's one more example of the messianic promises that are fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Verse 16, at first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him. And these things had been done to him. Verse 17, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. Now, there's a hard thing for us as Christians to understand. The primary purpose of Jesus' coming is not to make our smaller story better. Now, when he does, I'm happy about that. Make no mistake about that. But that is not his primary story, his primary purpose. His primary purpose has to do with our larger story and our eternal joy. And sometimes that requires suffering, hardship, and shattered dreams. Uh, the fourth group, or the fourth example here, is seekers of the larger story. And there are Gentile visitors that are coming in for Passover, uh, even though they're not Jewish people. But, but they're there, and they, they're interested. They've heard stories, and there's something of a seeking heart in these, in these guys. There were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with their request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. We would like to see Jesus. In other words, we would like to, to sit down with him and have a conversation with him. We'd like to get to know him. This, this is, sounds like a very intriguing person that we want to know. Now, how would Jesus reply to that? Well, he replies to this in ways that, again, sometimes just make no sense to you and I. Verse 23. So he's telling his disciples 
who are then going to tell the, the Greek visitors, the hour has come for the Son of Man, meaning himself, to be glorified, meaning he's going to be hanging on a cross. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, how would you like to be the disciples who are going back to the Greek messengers and tell them, well, I know you wanted to have a sit down with Jesus and have a conversation with him, but, but here's what he told us to tell you. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. I suspect it was you or me who kind of go, huh? What does that mean? And I think what it means simply is, uh, you, you do well to want to know me and to have a sit-down conversation with me, but hold on to your hats because you're going to see something far more wondrous that will display something of who I really am in my death. Buckle up your seatbelt for what you're about to see. And then a few verses later, he is thinking about what's coming and the terrors and horrors of this. He says, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Now, I, I love this verse. Because what it tells us is that even Jesus felt the sting and, and the awful disappointment and suffering of this world. And he was honest about that. He wasn't pretending. He wasn't saying, well, you know, God's going to do a great thing anyway. I mean, that, that's true, but it's not all that's true about shattered dreams. He's very honest about what's going on in his inner world. I, I am troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Is that, is that, is that the, the right response to do? You know, get me out of here is what, you know, what we would say. And then he says, no, as he sort of verbally processing and praying at the same time, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. And then he says, Father, glorify your name. In other words, what he realized is that his, his smaller story is about to get really ugly and really painful. What, so what is his north star here? His north star is the larger story. The north star in the larger story is the glory of God. God, would you somehow use my life and, what I'm, and the suffering I'm go going to go through somehow to bring honor to yourself in such a way that people are drawn to you? That's the, that's the glory that he's talking about here. Take, take the pieces of the, the shattered glasses of my life, whatever that looks like, and do something wondrous in such a way that people are drawn to you. And then, for only the third time in the New Testament, and I have a picture of sort of the clouds parting and a voice coming down, God the Father speaks to his son audibly. Then a voice came down from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now, what it makes me think about is, what would, what would entice God the Father to speak verbally about his son three times? Well, the first was his baptism. And that's kind of the beginning of his ministry. And you remember the story where the dove, representing the Holy Spirit, comes down and, and alights upon him. And God says, this is my son in whom I delight. And the second time is the transfiguration where the three disciples see Jesus and the wonder of his glory there on that hill. And God the Father again speaks, this is my son, listen to him. And this is the third time that we have it in this particular thing where he says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Why would God say something like this just before or just at the end of this, uh, at this prayer? Because he realizes the wrestling that's going on in his heart, meaning he recognizes the wrestling that goes on in your heart and my heart when we go through hard times. And he sees the fight that we're in to either make it about our smaller story or yield to the larger story. And he sees his son yield to the larger story. And you can almost hear God saying, that's my boy. That's what I'm after, not just in him, but in all of us. Years ago, when our, when our son was uh, about seven or eight years old, uh, he was on a soccer team. The beginning of the season had started, and he got the ball in one of the games uh, in our defensive end, and he had a breakaway on about two-thirds of the field. And back then, he was lightning fast, and he took off 
right down the sideline in front of where, you know, on our side of the field, we were all sitting in our lawn chairs and cheering, and he had bright blonde hair and was kind of flying in the breeze. And, and he just went all the way down the field, beat all the other defenders down there on the breakaway, and scored a goal. And as he went by, there was a dad behind me, this is very early in the season, and he said, wow, who, who is that kid? And I sat there and heard it. And I, I thought, you know, if I was a godly man, I probably wouldn't say anything. <laughs> but I couldn't help myself. I turned around with a big smile and said, that's my boy. That's my boy. Now, there's something wondrous about this right here in John chapter 12. The crowd spoke up, verse 34. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever, so how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? They're wrestling with, what, what is it you're talking about? And he's referring to, of course, the cross. Well, the, the last group in our story are uh, deniers of the larger story or even fighters of the larger story. Uh, and, and this is really, these are tough verses to read. Uh, verse 37. Um, and this sentence is just poignant with information. Even after is how it starts. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs, a plethora of evidence. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. It's not a, not a lack of knowledge, not a lack of evidence. A stubborn, willful, I am not going to take what you're saying to me about the larger story. And then John says, this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, I remember, I, as many of you know, I became a Christian at age 20, and I was just like this before I became a Christian. Uh, you, you could have lined up every proof in front of me about the, the deity of Christ and the resurrection and all in the Bible, and I would have said, oh, I'm not interested. Now, why? One is, I was committed to my smaller story, and it didn't appear to me that believing in God was going to help my smaller story at all. In fact, it seemed to me, from what I knew from, uh, of, of Christianity, that the larger story was going to play havoc with my smaller story, and I wanted hands off. I wanted to drive my smaller story, and I didn't want God to do anything with that. In fact, I thought, and like these men here, that the, that the larger story was a threat to my smaller story, to my joy, and to what I wanted Verse 39, for this reason, they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, and then here is one of those things where you go, huh, what is he talking about here? He, meaning God, and he's quoting from Isaiah, God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Now, in Romans chapter 1, we have an example of when people want to go their own way, uh, even though it creates misery for themselves, God lets them go. He, he, he gives them up to their own way. You want to be the boss of your life? You're committed to that? You want to do that? Good luck with that, but go ahead. Not going not to twist our arm. Uh, but after uh, three times where God says that to us, he let them go. Um, what does God do if, he can, if, if the people continue to go their own way and they harden their hearts harder and harder and harder? What does he do? Well, what Isaiah says here is he does something very surprising to us. He makes their heart even harder. Now, why would he do that? Well, we have a simple phrase for that. Hitting bottom. Hitting bottom. Uh, if a person does not see the effects of the hardness of their heart in real life, this point in time, 
Uh, what would awaken them? Well, kindness hasn't. Mercy hasn't. Evidence hasn't. So maybe if we speed up the process of hardness, people will see the misery that comes with a hard heart. And so God goes into a painful overdrive here uh, with these particular men here. The point is not to harden their hearts permanently, but hoping they would see the misery that they're bringing to themselves and to other people. Um, and then the, the, we finish with the parable again of the, the lesson of the seed. Back in verse 23. The hours come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat or a seed falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. All of these things are reminders of something very, very unique about Christianity. It is such a paradox. It's only as the seed says, I am willing to die. I'm willing to be buried in a, in a dark, dirty tomb and to be drowned in water away from sunlight that it has the opportunity to, pr to produce something like these pink flowers. And he goes on to say something of the other, other paradoxes here. Anyone who loves their life, meaning anyone who is committed to their smaller story as the most important thing in their life. He says, anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world, and he uses the, 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 the word uh, not literally hate, but in contrast, says, no, living for my, my own smaller story is truly a bad idea. I want the larger story living on top, superimposed upon my life. Anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life, for eternal joy. The paradox, whoever serves me, Nobody wants to serve. Everybody wants to be the top dog. Whoever follows me, I don't want to follow anybody. Paradox, paradox. Where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. You and I live in a culture that is filled with lies. Probably the most prevalent one I hear is, what's true for me is true for me, and what's true for you is true for you. It sounds so noble, but it's foolishness. Well, you can have God all you want, but I'm not going to God unless I've used up every other resource first. Foolishness. Um, well, I'm willing to stay in marriage as long as I still have the feelings of love, but if I don't have the feelings of love, don't tell me I need to stay. Uh, if somebody... If you won't accept my lifestyle, you hate me. A lie. It's foolishness. Uh, you need to live for number one. Nobody else will live for number one except you. Foolishness. A lie. I just want to be free. I want to be free to do what I want to do and live the way I want to live. That's the road to ultimate misery. Freedom is, is the power to be able to do what I ought, not the, the desire to do whatever I want. Doing whatever I want is going to bring me a heap of trouble. And then the one that uh, I hear oftentimes, particularly from young adults, if you don't know what to do, follow your heart. Please don't do that. That is a bad idea. Go to someone and get some wisdom. Well, I do like the parable of the, uh, the seed, the lesson of the seed. And it does remind me, um, oh, there you are. I forgot where you were. Um, it does remind me of a story. I'd like to finish with this story. Um, it's sort of a story and an allegory, so bear with me. Uh, but there was a young servant girl, about 20 years old, who worked in India uh, at the royal palace for her mistress. And every day, as a part of her duties, she would take a long pole and two clay pots and would put the, the, the pole on her back of her neck and she would walk down to the stream down the hill and fill up both pots and bring both pots back up 
and give them to the kitchen staff. And her job was to supply enough water at the beginning of every day uh, for the life of what was going on in the palace. Uh, and she did this every day, um, and she had these two pots. Now, here's where you need to use your imagination, and it's an allegory. One of the pots was a complete pot, and every time that she filled that pot with water, and she went back up carrying the pot on her water, by the time she got back up to the palace, this pot still had all of its water. But the other pot had a crack in it. It was a cracked pot. And every time that she took, filled up that, that pot with water and took it up to the palace, by the time she got there, only about half of the water was still in that pot. Now, one day, the cracked pot had to come to Jesus' meeting about herself. And she said, oh, my servant girl, I am so sorry. I have a crack in my pot. And every day, when you go to bring water up, uh, the other pot has a full pot, and I only have half a pot by the time we get there. And I am so ashamed that I make your life harder. And you have to come back here more often because of me and because of the crack in my pot. And the servant girl was sort of taken by this. And she said, well, you don't need to feel ashamed. And you don't need to think bad of yourself about this. And the crack pot was quite intrigued by that. And the servant girl continued, because I've known about the crack in your pot for two years. And every time that uh, I, I fill you up with with water, I know that about half of it's going to go. But this time when we walk back up the hill, I want you to notice the path on your side of the path, what you see, and what you don't see on the other side of the path. And so she filled up the two pots with water, she put the, the pots on her shoulder, and she began to walk up the path. And on the right side of the path, the crack pot noticed that all along the path were a bunch of wildflowers. Beautiful wildflowers. And along the other side of the path, it was just dirt. And they got up to the top of the hill, and, uh, and she put the, took, took the, uh, the pole off, and she talked to the uh, crack pot. She said, what did you see? I saw a bunch of beautiful flowers all along the path there. And the girl smiled. And she said, a couple years ago, when I realized that you had a crack in your pot, I bought a bunch of flower seeds and I planted them on your side of the path. And every day for two years, you have watered those seeds. And every day after, I, after we're done getting water, I come out with my clippers. And I cut fresh flowers for my mistress and put them in a vase. And the flowers bring great beauty into the royal palace. And she went inside, and she came back out to show the, the cracked pot her example for the day. This is the lesson of the seed. That crack pot that about you, that crack that annoys you about you and annoys me about me, and that weakness in your life that you just think, oh, why, why, and you feel shame over that. God can use even that for his glory. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to find our place in the larger story. It's not enough to be a fan of the larger story. If we are a seeker of the larger story, that's better. But help us to, to, to culminate in connecting with the larger story. And help us not to be fighters and deniers of the larger story. Help us to not be like Judas, who is committed to his smaller stories in such a way that it blinds him to the effect he has on everyone around him. But help us to be Mary, who offers herself as best she can with what she has to Jesus, and to let Jesus use her life 
and her heart and her soul, the beauty that is in there, that you have put in there, to be a blessing to people. Help us to emulate her. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.